Fly home, fly south to me Wing through the sky And let me hear your cry of gladness Many miles to travel through the day and night Heading for the south land ever on your flight Fleeing from the north wind down across the state Down to where the sun shines That's where my love waits That's where my love waits Fly high and free Fly home, fly south to me Wing through the sky And let me hear your cry Glenn Campbell recorded this song, inspired by the annual migrations of the Lesser Snow Goose, in 1972. Today, their epic journey is still a landmark in the natural cycle of North America. It's late May, but up here in the far north, spring hasn't yet arrived. Much of the land beneath the geese still matches the snow white of their wings. They're well named snow geese, Snow governs the rhythm of their lives. They can't nest on their arctic breeding grounds until the snow retreats, usually in early June. They must raise their young by the time the snow comes again in September. They're headed for one of the most desolate parts of North America, the tundra to the west of Hudson Bay, where the McConnell River spills out in a delta three kilometers wide. This year, just before the snow geese arrive, a plain lands in this barren place. The geese will be lingering to the south, knowing by some uncanny instinct that the snow hasn't cleared from their nesting grounds. Aboard the plane are Des and Jen Bartlett, an Australian naturalist camera team, with their nephew Les and their friend and assistant Lee Lyon. Apart from a handful of scientists, they'll be the only people to share the empty tundra with the snow geese. Everything they need for the next four months must be flown in. The plane takes off to fetch another load of stores. The Bartlett's have had to plan their supplies like a military operation. If they've forgotten anything now, it's just too bad. After one more trip, the plane won't be coming back. Home for the Bartlett's for the next four months will be a drafty tent on the tundra. Amid a flurry of snow, they set up house. The ground is still too frozen to drive in tent pegs, and so they tie the guy ropes down to rocks. <laughs> Almost at once, they experience one of the most engaging things about life on the tundra. Its wild creatures are so trusting. These willow ptarmigan immediately begin to share their campsite with them. The first sign that spring is really on its way is the breakup of ice in the McConnell River. On the 23rd of May, the great day dawned. The first flock of geese flew over the tundra, still dappled with snow. Among the snow geese were a few Canada geese. With this pair, there's a blue goose, not a separate species, but a color variation of the lesser snow known as the blue phase. In the next few days, the geese kept coming in earnest. Some sandhill cranes flew with them. They nest up here too. 
All these birds were driven by the age-old pressures that tell them they have only a short time in which to raise a new generation. They're impatient to land and settle down to domestic life. Their instincts haven't betrayed them. The snow is clearing at last. A heat haze shimmers over the tundra. The daytime heat is deceptive and overnight it freezes hard again. The colony settles down amazingly quickly. One reason is that the geese don't have to look for a mate on arrival. They mate for life. Newly formed pairs have done their courting on the final stages of the journey north while they were waiting for the snow to clear. The pairs fly around looking for a nesting site. There are still domestic problems to be sorted out. House hunting, for instance, and squabbles with future neighbours. Each pair has to establish its nesting territory. This particular blue goose seems to have problems with everyone. They all find somewhere to live in the end and egg laying starts straight away. In the Arctic, the snow geese have few enemies. It's one of the reasons why they fly thousands of kilometers to the tundra to nest. But sandhill cranes are certainly a menace. They're very partial to snow goose eggs. A snow goose colony loses about 10% of its eggs, and it's not only the sandhill cranes who do the damage. This is an arctic skewer, which takes not only eggs, but chicks. But then skewers have got to live too. They're nesting close by and they'll soon have hungry young of their own to feed. Herring gulls seldom miss the chance of an egg and are always on the watch for an unguarded goose nest. Despite the casualties, an amazing number of eggs survive. Each female broods an average of about five eggs for just over three weeks. The goslings hatch out almost simultaneously. They're active and independent little creatures right from the start. As soon as the goslings are dry, the mother leads them away from the nest, which no longer serves any purpose. She takes them onto the open tundra towards the river. The youngsters feed hungrily. There's often one who's greedier and liable to get left behind. They're bound by very strong family ties for safety's sake. Stragglers are bound to end up in trouble. A pair of sandhill cranes have a nest nearby. That's why they're so aggressive. Both snow geese parents gallantly defend their young. But the cranes don't give up easily. A gosling makes a nourishing snack. The lagging gosling escapes thanks to the determination of its parents.
battle will only end when the snow geese have left the crane's territory. Now the family is reunited, but the straggler is still on its own. It's so busy feeding, it stumbles over a tiny semi-palmated sandpiper sitting on her nest. It's really harrying to catch up now, right through a covey of willow ptarmigan. The thawing tundra has made a maze of pools. It's one of the things that makes it an ideal nesting place for waterfowl. The snow goose family is ready for its first swim, but of course there's one left behind. It was thirsty work dodging those sandhill cranes. The rest of the family joins the swimming party in the McConnell River with one latecomer. When the little flotilla reaches a rock in midstream, the rest of the family swims around it, one way or the other. But the little straggler once again has its own solution to the problem. It's just one of those geese that does things differently. In a colony of 200,000 snow geese, there are bound to be waifs and strays, often those who've hatched late and aren't ready to leave the nest with the rest of the family. The Bartlett's couldn't leave all these abandoned youngsters to die of cold and starvation, so they set about rescuing those who seemed to have some chance of survival. These included both blue and white goslings. Now, whenever they moved about the tundra filming, they had to take the orphans with them. When the goslings were very small, the easiest way to carry them was in a cardboard box. Orphaned goslings quickly attach themselves to people. They become convinced that the humans are their real parents. Scientists call this process imprinting. So very soon, the Bartlett's found that they'd imprinted a dozen permanent additions to their family. Now they couldn't do a thing around the campsite without the geese joining in. When they set off on photographic trips, the goslings came along too, just as they'd have followed their real snow goose parents. Mosquitoes can make summer on the tundra hard to endure. The goslings repaid the Bartlett's kindness by helping to keep the numbers in check. At a month old, the youngsters were nearly ready to fly. They spent a good deal of their time preening their fast-growing flight feathers. They also pulled at Des Bartlett's waders in play. Practice for pulling up roots, perhaps.
the orphans became involved with all the domestic chores, particularly when wash day came around. If the goslings mistook the Bartlett's for their parents, it's hard to guess what they made of another member of the family adopted on an earlier northern expedition, a sandhill crane called Fred. Fred kept down the numbers of another tundra pest, the fiercely biting horseflies. When the orphans were six weeks old, the Bartlett's gave their goose children elementary taxiing and takeoff lessons. The young geese and the wild flocks were down at the coast, but the orphans stayed near the camp. There was now no doubt that they were part of the family. When the wild geese migrated south, the orphans would somehow have to travel as part of the Bartlett household. Young geese rely entirely on their parents to lead them on the 4,000 kilometer journey southwards. These humans were the only parents the orphans knew. If the Bartlett's geese hadn't yet gained their full powers of flight, the wild geese around the McConnell River had entirely lost theirs. Shortly after they finished nesting, all the adult geese on the tundra molt their flight feathers in preparation for growing a new set. The adults can't fly, and their young haven't yet learned to. It's a great opportunity for the small party of scientists who have a base on the McConnell River to round up the geese so that they can mark as many as possible. Some have been marked already with red neck collars in previous years. The first move is to get the geese into the river. This isn't too difficult. Being flightless, they feel safer on the water. The roundup involves about 5,000 geese, all told, Canada's as well as blues and snows. Once they're close to the banding pens, the geese have to be persuaded to take to dry land again. The dark birds in the foreground are mostly this year's young. The scientists will be especially interested in the birds that have been caught before, the ones with neck collars and rings. It all helps to build up a picture of snow goose movement. At first, the only movement they're interested in is the one that will take the geese into the pen. Collecting individual records of these geese as they pass along their migration flyway is absolutely vital to the survival of their species. By August, the young snow geese out on the tundra are nearly full-sized. They've moved away from the nesting grounds. There's plenty of food for them. The tundra grasses and wildflowers are at their richest. The youngsters can pick and choose from the choicest tidbits all around them. Now's the time when they learn to fly. At first, their landings are a bit bumpy. They have some unexpected hazards to avoid, like this caribou sporting in the brief Arctic sunshine. They quickly become more and more proficient. Their new one flying ability frees them from any serious danger from predators, even one as large and potentially hostile as this.
see spreen and splash. By August, they're fully proficient flyers, ready to face the long journey that will take them south ahead of the coming winter. One day in early September, there's a flicker of white wings over the tundra. The north wind has told the geese it's time to go. And so southward they point their way, southward they fly away, ahead of the snow. Down from Hudson Bay they seem to fill the sky, flying close together, racing very high. It's goodbye to the tundra bay, soar through the freezing air, searching for sun. Fly high and free, fly home, fly south to me. Wing through the sky and let me to travel through the day and night heading for the southland ever on your flight fleeing from the north wind down across the states down to where the sunshine that's where my love waits that's where my love waits Year after year, the geese that nest around Hudson Bay follow the same route. It's called the Central Flyway, and it reaches down through the Dakotas and Oklahoma to Texas and the Gulf Coast. Human travelers have to overcome bureaucratic hurdles, as the Bartlett family found out. They had another family traveling with them, their orphan snow and blue geese. As they drove towards the US border, the geese were riding in a specially constructed trailer. The Bartlett's hadn't anticipated any trouble in getting the geese across. They'd got the necessary health permits. But the US Customs Authorities are nothing if not thorough and the regulations aren't exactly specific about trailer-born snow geese entering the United States. Jen Bartlett and her young nephew Les got out to declare the contents of the trailer to the US border inspection. Des Bartlett positioned the ladder so that the geese could climb down and make themselves known. The customs men were interested, but not particularly impressed. The Bartlett's pointed to the wild snow geese winging their way southwards in their thousands. The customs men said, reasonably enough, that they had no control over wild geese. They enjoyed a different status. They were airborne. When Des suggested that he could get his own geese airborne, they raised no objection. The geese took off, and as everyone watched, they headed northward straight back into Canada. The Bartlett's weren't worried. At least they were cleared to drive over the border. They got back into their cars without the geese and drove a few hundred meters into North Dakota.
For a little while, the geese kept flying northwards. Then gradually they swung round and headed back south again towards the United States. The Bartlett's parked by the side of the highway. Their orphans had crossed the border, flying exactly like their wild relatives, and in a few moments they had landed beside the cars. The pressure of time dictated that it would be better for them to continue their journey by road. At last they were all safely aboard. When the Bartlett's turned round and drove back to say goodbye, the border officials gave the geese full clearance and asked the Bartlett's for their autographs. It's 1,600 kilometers from Hudson Bay to the US border. It's a further 500 kilometers to the first main staging point on the Central Flyway, Sand Lake Refuge, South Dakota. The Bartlett's drove south to catch up with the wild flocks as they flew in. There are few more impressive sights in nature than Sand Lake Refuge when the fall migration of snow geese flies in. As yet, only a comparatively small proportion of the birds have arrived. Against a backdrop of fall colours, new arrivals soar into the cornfields that have been specially planted to feed migrant waterfowl. Sand Lake has only recently become such an important stopover for migrating snow geese. The refuge was started in the 30s for ducks journeying south from their nesting grounds on the Canadian prairies. Today, up to a quarter of a million snow geese virtually take over Sand Lake in the fall and stay until winter catches up with them and pushes them on southwards. That many snow geese eat a great deal of corn. There's always plenty of waste maize left on the ground after the harvester moves on. The geese are unaware that the noisy machine is working for their benefit and soon they take off en masse. A blizzard of geese, a blizzard in which every single flake is a bird weighing over two kilograms. After circling nervously for a while, the immense flock, frightened by the harvester, heads back to the safety of Sand Lake itself. The harvester has done its work. Some of the corn is laid down in a trail to encourage the geese to feed in one carefully chosen area. 
This man is loading a goose gun, but he's not a hunter. He's a member of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Lured by the golden grain, the geese start to plane in. There are a lot of greyish young birds among them. They haven't got the caution of their elders, who are more used to the strange, often dangerous ways of humans. There are mallards among the geese. The cannon looks menacing, but it's not there to kill, only to propel large nets. About 200 snow and blue geese have been caught, but it's done them no harm. For such wild creatures, geese are strangely adaptable. Under the net, they stand quietly until the wildlife service men release them. The next stage in the migration study is to follow individual birds along the flyway. It helps the biologists to provide for their needs and understand their problems. The great flocks of snow geese stay at Sand Lake until winter creeps down from the Canadian prairies. By late October, the first snow flurries powder the grasses along the lake shore. The geese won't stay much longer if the cold weather continues. Blue and snow geese crowd onto water that is on the verge of freezing. By November, it's hard to find food. The cornfields are locked in by snow and ice. The cold isn't the problem, it's the lack of food. It's time to head south again. It would be so nice if they could only stay But those icy fingers pushed them on their way So it's up high above the clouds Leaders all calling loud Keep moving on And they shape their skeins into those fine bees and they cross the land to flee the chilly breeze For the autumn is passing soon Winter is on the moon Oh, where is home? Fly high and free Fly home, fly south Down to where the sun shines That's where my love waits That's where my love waits Fly high and free Fly home, fly south to me Wing through the sky And let me hear your cry Some of the geese will break their journey for a while at DeSoto Refuge on the border of Iowa and Nebraska. Others, impelled by the first snows whitening the farmlands far below, will push on further to the refuge at Squaw Creek in Missouri. Driving southwards ahead of the winter, the Bartlett soon found kinder weather. 
Now their goslings travel all the time with the back door of their trailer open. They got some fresh air that way, though not as much as their wild relatives flying thousands of meters overhead. It's over 4,000 kilometers from Hudson Bay to the Gulf Coast. They're well over halfway by now, the V-shaped skeins heading towards Squaw Creek. Seventy years ago, the vast majority of snow geese pressed on towards their wintering grounds on the Gulf Coast. A few still cover the entire 3,000 kilometer journey practically non-stop. But now that there's a chain of refuges all along the flyway, most break their journey several times. Wings set and paddles lowered as air breaks, the great birds come planing down out of the sky to make another stopover. Bartlett's made a stopover near Squaw Creek too. They'd followed the geese down the flyway, and like the birds, they appreciated the first hint of warmer weather. Looking after their gosling family has been a problem throughout the long journey. Every day, they've been allowed to fly free to exercise their wings. Every day, there's been a risk that some would fall to hunters. So far, they've lost only one. Today, in Missouri, they plan to take the geese for a swim behind their canoe. The other orphan travelling with them, the bird they adopted on a previous trip, joins the party. Sandhill cranes don't usually swim, but Fred is an exceptional bird in almost every way. For a while, the mixed family of snow and blue geese, with Fred bringing up the rear, follow Jen and her nephew Les in the canoe, but they soon revert to flying. They circle round the lake, but at this stage of their lives they never venture far from the Bartlett's, whom they still regard as their real parents. One day it will be different and the ties will weaken. For now, swimming and flying with their human parents is all that they demand of life. Although Fred can take off from water, he just paddles along behind. Most birds dry themselves by flapping their wings and shaking their feathers. So does Fred, up to a point. But he also likes a brisk rub down with a towel. No one can say why Fred does this. It's a strange piece of behavior even for a hand-reared crane. Although it's late fall, the days are finer now and the sunsets more like those of summer. A good deal of all bird migration takes place at night. Snow geese are especially good night flyers, navigating by the moon and stars. As the sun goes down, furnace red over Squaw Creek, many of the geese are beginning a night flight down the last stage of the flyway towards Texas.
keep going now, across Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana, and on towards the Gulf Coast and the rice prairies to the west of Houston. This last stretch of their migration covers about a thousand kilometers. And when the sun comes up after the long night flight, the skeins are still beating along with undiminished power. Snowfall has come to Texas. The blizzard of geese isn't quite as heavy as when they started out. A fifth of their total falls to hunters every year. The Fish and Wildlife Service say that the geese can stand this hunting pressure. In fact, their population is increasing. At last, the Gulf of Mexico lies ahead. The first small parties come whiffling joyously out of the sky. Snow geese often perform aerobatics, especially when losing height. It's a combination of precision flying and play. A small skein of snow geese circles round looking for a landing place. They're not put off by an oil pump or two, it's the farmland they want. Many of the coastal marshes where they once spent the winter have been spoiled for them by drainage and disturbance. On the rich farmland they can find rice, grain and sweet short grass, even a wildflower or two. These are young birds born a few months ago on the tundra and led all the way to Texas by their parents. For old and young, there's plenty of food among the rice fields and cattle ranches here. Julie, the Bartlett's daughter, joins them during school holidays. The Bartlett's realize that when spring comes, their geese may leave them to join up with the wild flocks. They're so tame that they've learned to fly behind the station wagon. It's an ideal opportunity to film some portraits while the family is still together.
Fred, the sandhill crane, likes to do his own thing behind a bicycle. The wild snow geese have stayed in the south all winter. So have the Bartlett's orphans. But in March, the wild birds begin to get restless. The urge to go north again is tugging at their hearts. Now, when Des and Jen take their geese out for exercise, they feel a tug at their hearts, too. They want the geese to return to the wild, but know that they'll feel bereaved when it happens. In the background, the wild geese talk insistently to each other, heralding the journey they will soon be making back to Hudson Bay. The Bartlett's geese seem to have become aware of the new restlessness. Could today be the day on which they break the ties that hold them to their human foster parents? The Bartlett's have adopted many young animals, but the snow geese have been something different, perhaps because they had the power to leave at any time, but have never exercised it. The wild geese become more and more clamorous. Suddenly, the orphans are on the wing. They begin a wide circle round the cars, as they've done many times before. Then they make a second circuit a little further away. This time when they fly over the cars, it's for the last time. They fly off, outlined against the cold blue of the spring sky where the north wind calls to them. The wild flocks taking off on spring migration all along the flyway will be the magnet that finally draws them north and convinces them that they are, after all, snow geese and not human beings. Far from where your heart's been, that's where I shall wait, that's where I shall wait, fly. Flying for 